I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and welcome to Open Book, where I talk with some of the most interesting and brilliant minds in our world today. Joining us now is Ambassador Gordon Sundland. He is a former U.S. ambassador to the EU. He was appointed by Donald J. Trump in 2018, and he wrote an incredible story about his journey, uh, and it's called The Envoy, Mastering the Art of Diplomacy with Trump and the World. What a title. And I got to tell you, Ambassador, it was a great book. I was given this book by Ambassador Sunland at the Romney event uh, in Park City, Utah, a few months back. I said, please come on the uh, Open Book Podcast. Uh, we sell books here. We recommend books. This is a great book on a number of different levels. It's a real human story about your life here and the situation that you got placed in as a result of the Ukrainian situation and the testimony that you had to provide. But I want to I want to go right to the parts of the book that I loved, if you don't mind, and that is your family. Uh, tell us about your family and your background. We'll get into the Trump stuff later, but I, I think it's, a, it's such a beautiful story. I grew up in Seattle. I was the first um, uh, U.S. citizen in my, in my family, uh, born, born on, on American soil. And by the way, before I continue, thanks for having me on, Anthony. I appreciate it. Uh, oh, no, it's my pl- my pleasure. And it, it, it's a fantastic book. We'll get into it in a sec. But I want to, so you're the first U.S. citizen. My parents were both Holocaust survivors. Uh, they essentially came here with nothing. I have a sister from the same two parents that's 20 years older than me. So when uh, I was one, she was getting married. Uh, it was almost like having two mothers. Uh, And I grew up in a very sort of lower, lower, middle class, small portion of a very wealthy neighborhood. And it really motivated me because everyone around me was rich. All the kids drove new cars when they turned 16. Their families went to Hawaii and Europe and elsewhere on vacation. And mine couldn't afford that. And it really motivated me and made me envious. And envy is an incredible driver. Well, yes, but tell us how you got started. Okay, so you built a beautiful, amazingly successful business. You in the lodging, hospitality business, among other things that you did. So, give us the transition. You come out of college. Well, I dropped out job? of college. I did about a year and a half, two years in college. Uh, I was bored and I was restless, and I wanted to make money. I was singularly focused on that. So, I started in the commercial real estate business, and I started selling small apartment buildings. Uh, I kind of sucked at it for about a year, and then I finally decided to shoot for the moon instead of at the time, you know, an apartment building was, small apartment building in Seattle was, you know, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. I decided to sell a full city block in downtown Seattle for at the time was $15 million, and this was in 1979, so that was a lot of money. And... You know, I almost ran out of money while I was trying to do it. But lo and behold, after about 10 months, I closed the deal. I made a little over a quarter of a million dollars uh, again in 1979, which was my first commission. My bank account was almost at zero. So walking in and depositing that $250,000 check was sort of an uplifting experience. All right. So now we're moving along. You got yourself involved in Republican Party politics. What attracted you to Donald Trump? I'm, and I'm going to tell people how you and I first met, which I think is an interesting part of the story. But what attracted you to well, Donald Trump? Well, as I Trump? say in The Envoy, I didn't know Trump uh, other than a sort of fateful meeting with him in 1988 at the uh, De- Republican convention in New Orleans when George H.W. Bush gave his famous uh, Peggy right. Noonan pen thousand points of light speech. And as I say, I ran into him yep. in the elevator lobby. He was a total dick. Uh, I was asking him about uh, uh, an issue he had confronted in his business that we were facing as well, that was very well publicized. I wasn't bothering him. No one was around. And he was very dismissive of me because he didn't know who I was. He'd never heard of me. I was young, et cetera, et cetera. The next day, I'm sitting in the bar with two other people whom he knew quite well. And he came over and he said, you know, tell me more about the hotel thing. And he couldn't have been nicer. And when I reminded him of that in 2016, I said, you were a real dick. But then the next day you were nice. Why why is that? He said, well, of course, I was nice the second day because you were with very important people. (laughs) 
Right. Well, I mean, the transparency is weirdly refreshing. It's almost it like is. so transparent that? that you you, know, you almost have to like, yeah, right. Right. No, because he's the dick of dicks. And so exactly. that's why it's so interesting. And that, you know, that's, that's why I wanted to bring it up. But, but we met, and I'm going to tell you where we met, see if you test your memory. We happened, I had the good fortune of sitting next to you at what was my first fundraiser. And so what I did was I traveled with Mr. Trump to New Mexico, and then we boarded his plane to LA and we went to, was it Tom's house? I think it was Tom exactly. Barrick's house. Uh, we went to Tom Barrick's house. It was a tent outside. We had Wolfgang Puck cooking the meal and it was a fundraiser. It was our first real fundraiser that I had organized with uh, Stephen Mnuchin, who went on to become the Secretary of Treasury. And you and I sat next to each other. We built a nice rapport with each other. And then I saw your name pop up in the transition. So I was on the executive transition team, and you had had your hand raised, I believe. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more or less in the record, uh, to be an ambassador. And so we were looking for different spots for you. And then, which I think is arguably one of the most prestigious ambassadorships in the world, because uh, people thought so well of you, you ended up as the ambassador to the EU. But you had to go through a very tough vetting process because of the partisanship going on in Washington. So tell us a little bit about that and tell us how you well, ended up Well, I almost wound up you know, with no job. I, I mean, while I greatly appreciated your advocacy and that of Steven Mnuchin's, I created or I committed, I should say, the unpardonable sin of dropping out of the campaign toward the end. And the reason I dropped out of the campaign, which I go through in the envoy, was that one of my key employees, who is Muslim, uh, said he was very unhappy with President Trump's uh, characterization during the Kazir Khan incident. And I said, listen, say no more if you're uncomfortable. Okay, so let's let's go over that for our view, not to interrupt you, but the Kazir Khan incident, the family lost their son in the military. Yeah, their family lost their their son. And instead of being an empathetic person, President Trump was highly critical of the family and the father in particular. Uh, It really turned off a lot of the Muslim American community, as well as the greater American community. It was one of those milestones in the campaign, which, you know, included the remarks coming down the escalator, the the TMZ tape, and now this. Uh, And I was put in a very difficult position. So I said, listen, you're more important to me than a political campaign. I will step down. I had already raised some money for the campaign. I had done my part. So when Trump finally became the nominee, Uh, and then became president of the United States, this employee came back to me and said, listen, we have to support the president of our party. This guy was also a Republican. And he said, I'll get over it. If you want to participate, go ahead. You won't have any issues with me. So at that point, the campaign was over. He had already won. And I decided the only way to re-engage in the campaign was to essentially attend the inauguration and reconnect with all the people that I, you know, uh, lost contact with in those last three months, which I did. Yeah. And, and, and one of the best parts of this for me is, and, and I'll tell the story quickly. We were raising money for Mr. Trump. Uh, the establishment hated him. I mean, let's just be honest about it. None of the large scale donors that I, I was successful at raising money for governor Romney in 2012 wanted to give Mr. Trump any money. And so we did an event at Cipriani's in Midtown at 42nd Street in June of 2016. So a few few months uh, before the election, and it was obviously a month before the nomination. And I think only Scaramucci's were there, Gordon. I think I had to get my mother there. I had to get my cousins. I was bringing them in from Long Island. We we had a but, but, but the, the venue you know, was Trump almost go big crazy enough to us. house all the Scaramucci's. So yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. It was almost big enough, but we had every Scaramucci that known to mankind in the room and he was yapping away about his Twitter strategy and so forth. But we literally raised him no money. Mnuchin and I were sort of embarrassed. And then fast forward to December, which I think you'll remember this, we had a fundraiser there for the transition. And for the inauguration itself. And of course, for the inauguration, I'm sorry, for the inauguration. And the line was out the door. 
you it was completely packed. And of course, Trump being Trump, now he you love says, me. Hey, now, yeah, where now were you guys? You love me. <laughs> yeah, where were you guys last time? Yeah, he loved it. Exactly, yeah. he loved it. Yeah, it was. Well, a, I, I yeah, decided, yeah, look, I mean, look, look I mean, I'm, point, I'm the only way I would get back into good graces was to make an impact. So when this, when this employee of mine came to me and said, "You can re-engage," I said, "How about this? Would you and your family like to join my family and me at the inauguration?" And he said, "Wow, that would be great. I've never been to a presidential inauguration." So I bought the big ticket, and the big ticket at the time was a million dollars. And that got a lot of attention yep. because the, you know, the wags and the press said, oh, you wrote a million dollar check and got an ambassadorship, which tells me that the press really doesn't understand how the process works because there were about 60, there yeah, were about well, of 60 course. people so, well, that, but, who wrote and, and checks so, for a million dollars and none of them got an ambassadorship. So, well, yeah, of course. So go, go into that. So you, you get, you get, you, you write the check. Uh, uh, and of course, What's interesting is, for some reason, when Democrats are writing checks like that, the press is not writing about it, and they don't care. But when the Republicans are doing it, they try to point it out. This is the reason why there's so much dishonesty in the media at this point, and why many Americans, I I would say citizens globally, are really starting to distrust the media. I mean, we have the media out there right now propping up a a fraud in the cryptocurrency markets. Well, we can get into that. this, you know, uh, a little but, later, but one of the things I advocate for Anthony yeah. very strongly, which is completely uh, counterintuitive to what you hear in the media is for more political appointees uh, representing the United States, not less. Yes. I want to, I want, I want to try. And I, and I think it's the right thing to do because you need alternative thought. You need to get out of the artifice of Washington and the State Department, and you need exactly. fresh eyes on problems, and you need experienced business people like you that really love the country, are a product of the country, have lived the American dream, want to further the goals of the country. Uh, you write so beautifully about all this stuff. Before I go into that, though, I'd like you to share your views, views of Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney. Uh, both of those people I consider personal friends. I know them both very well, work for both of their presidential campaigns. Um, you write about them. Why, why do you think they were both underrated by the Republican Party and the Republican Party vote? Well, I think the Republican Party was really looking for a complete upstart. Um, both Mitt Romney and Jeb Bush uh, both of whom I care for a great deal. Uh, they're both good friends. In fact, uh, full disclosure, I'm an investor with Jeb in some of his private equity uh, investments. Um, they're great guys, but they definitely drive in the middle of the of the lane. They don't veer outside the lines. They're very decent people. And I think the frustration with the Obama years in the Republican Party, particularly in the more conservative wing of our party, was so great. They wanted a flamethrower. They wanted someone to put a turd in the punch bowl, however you want to describe it. And they did not think that either Jeb or Mitt, in his case, would be that man. In the the case of Donald, there's no question. All right. Well, we agree with that. So it's interesting. We're in an age now where experience, policy, wonkishness, intellectual curiosity to do the job is perhaps less interesting to the voter. What's more interesting to the voter is express the anger that they're feeling. You know, they feel disassociated with the American dream. Many people feel disaffected from the establishment. And so Mr. Trump, I think we would both agree, uh, represented that. And and he represented that in a very strong and powerful way, upsetting at times to people like your employee. But by and large, that's why he was able to galvanize the Republican Party. It, it is. is that fair and, to say? You know, in, in fairness, you worked for a short time for him in this job in the White House. I worked a little longer. Uh, to give him some credit, he was very restless about getting things done. And he was one of these people who checked his watch, not his calendar. Um, I remember clearly many times when in the morning he would want something done and he wondered why three o'clock in the afternoon it, it, it wasn't already underway. When some presidents wouldn't even turn to that issue for months, if not years, he was at it relentlessly. And frankly, that's how I think we got the FDA to approve those vaccines so quickly was because he would not take no for an answer. He was relentless. And I think that's what the American people saw in him when they voted to elect him president. 
Yeah, I mean it's un- it's unfortunate because you know the a, a, the Operation Warp Speed, which you're referring to, he does deserve credit for that. Uh, uh, of course, uh, now Vice President Kamala Harris said she would never take the Trump vaccine until she no did. Circumstances, and then. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and then it didn't become the Trump vaccine. And so there's a little bit of this nonsense that goes on with the partisanship of even our scientific establishment. We've got a lot of people in our country that don't believe in these vaccines. Some people think that they're making them sick and all this stuff. So there's wild amounts of disinformation out there. Uh, but let's go to you, because I think you had one of the more interesting jobs. You write about this in the book. You had the uh, you're the ambassador to the EU. You're in Brussels, but you're also. The ambassador to NATO is there. The ambassador to Belgium is there. You have three U.S. ambassadors in one European city. So describe it to us. Describe what your life was like, how you interacted with those ambassadors, how you interacted with NATO, the EU, country of Well, Belgium. it was a very touchy ambassadorship, as you point out, in that in some cases, those three ambassadors, it would be hard to find a room big enough to contain the three egos that each ambassador had. And who's you know, who's the alpha in the in the relationship. In my case, I was very fortunate. I my colleagues included Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, who was the ambassador to NATO, and Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Ron Gidwitz, Mm -hmm. uh, who was the ambassador to Belgium. And we really did a great job Mm -hmm. of dancing together. We each stayed in our lane when it came to our respective missions, but we operated the city as a tri mission and we used each other's resources and assets to accomplish the tasks we needed to accomplish. So I spent a lot of time at NATO. Yeah. I spent a lot of time I, literally across. I love I love that. I, I love the collaborate. And this is another reason why I'm in your camp that more business people, entrepreneurs, they need to get involved with the process because you can help lubricate the diplomatic system, if you will. And you also realize that it's a collaboration. It doesn't have to be an ego bashing festival. Um, do you feel like you succeeded in your role, Gordon? I do. Gordon? In fact, when the whistleblower complaint surfaced and everything got sidelined, not just in my role, but in the entire administration, focusing on that first impeachment, we were on the cusp of closing so many deals. We had already closed a few, and we were on the cusp of closing so many, which literally got washed down the river as Congress started to focus on the impeachment, and I really couldn't be effective in my job after that. It was very difficult. Right. Well, you're a man. You, you, you did a great job. You testified honestly. And when you felt like you couldn't do the job because of all the different circumstances, you bowed out gracefully. Unfortunately, that happens in politics. You know, I got fired after 11 days. I said something really stupid, which was regrettable. Uh, but I owned it. I mean, and I, I didn't blame anybody else but myself. I accepted the firing. And I think, you know, because you've seen me with General Kelly, we're very close friends today. Uh, no harm, no foul. That's the nature of politics. I think you're a total gentleman. You come across as a total gentleman in the book, which I admire. I want to talk about President Zelensky for a second. Because you had the opportunity to build a relationship with him. Uh, and you hosted him in 2019. Tell us your opinion of President Zelensky. Tell us why you were hoping for closer U.S.-Ukraine cooperation, and maybe you can give us some of your insight into the current debacle that's taking place between the Russians and the Ukrainians. Well, President Zelensky was, you know, an unconventional uh, candidate and successful candidate. He was very much like a Ronald Reagan, where people criticized his show business background. What business does this guy have running Ukraine? He's an actor. And I think we've seen with 2020 hindsight that not only is the guy smart and tough, but he's a baller. I mean, he really is. Uh, most people in his position would have had a Swiss bank account and would have been on a, you know, on a global express hightailing out of Ukraine the minute the bullets started flying. And he's there in a flak jacket while missiles are flying over his head. Um, n- there's no question the Russians wanted to take. Did you? Are you surprised by that? Well, because some of the people in the conventional press were, but after you meeting him and getting to know well, him, were you surprised all, by that? It's it, it's a it's a difficult question because when we met him, we knew right away that he and the president, President Trump, would get along really well, and we were just trying to get the two of them together in the same room to shoot the shit, nothing more, no asks, no gives, 
just get to know one another because we thought once Trump met Zelensky, good things would happen for Ukraine. And of course, Giuliani pokes his nose in the middle of this and ruined that entire strategy. And both Secretary Perry and uh, uh, Secretary, pardon me, Ambassador Volker were frustrated by that. But no, to get back to Zelensky, we thought he was smart. We thought he was tough. But until the bullets started flying, no one even knew what kind of toughness the guy had. What do you think happens? We've got a war that's gone on almost 10 months now. Uh, it's dragging on. We're going into the winter. You know the area well. You know the geography. You've read our intelligence briefings. What, I what think, think unfortunately, happen? it's totally up to us as to what happens. It's not up to Europe. It's not up to Japan. It's not up to Australia. It's up to us. We can put our foot further down on the gas and end this war quickly, or we can continue to pretend that we don't want it escalated, that the Russians are giving us some sort of deference because we haven't gone further in. Uh, in terms of both the armaments we're supplying, the intelligence we're supplying, clearing the airspace in Ukraine, all of the different things that we would do if it were our fight rather than the Ukrainians' fight. And I do think because it's the doorstep to Europe, I think we have to put our foot down on the gas and finish this war quickly. I think any negotiations prior to a decisive military victory would be an enormous mistake. Okay, and so you believe that the Ukrainians can beat only with our help the Russians, only with our help, right? But we, well, are, we, we are, are helping them. them so I mean, we're so helping them judiciously and tentatively, and we're 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 trying to right. walk this tightrope, which I think created this sort of um, face saving pretext for the Russians. Right. I think the Russian economy is in shambles. I think that Putin is on the ropes. I think if there is ever a time to finish this, it's now. Okay, so how would you finish it? Give me the policy prescription to finish it. I think it. the way what I would, would finish do? it, and, and you know, you can have multiple military experts on your show that can give you chapter and verse better than I, but the lethality of the weapons that we provide the Ukrainians... Uh, the intelligence we provide them, and the fact that we need to own the airspace over Ukraine, which may in fact cause us to have to get into a direct shooting war with Russian MiGs, I don't think we have a choice. I think if this drags out, uh, you're going to wind up in a sloppily negotiated settlement, which will reward the Russians for their behavior and only strengthen Putin's hand inside of Russia. I think Putin needs to be punched hard in the nose, and I think our allies need to be brought along with us, even if it means leveraging some of our trade uh, levers that we have to insist that they join us in this effort. We don't have a choice. Putin started it. We have to end it. All right. I, you know, so I, think it's, I think it's well said, and I appreciate it. I want to go back to the impeachment hearings. Uh, uh, the, uh, m most of the Americans uh, that are watching this podcast, I mean, even some of the Europeans that watch my podcast, will remember you uh, from your thoughtful testimony. You agreed to cooperate, uh, but you also had some opinions related to the quote unquote Trump famous conversation. Tell us about that. Tell us why you agreed to cooperate. Tell us, you know, your thoughts about your testimony. Uh, give us a sense. For well, what just a little book. correction, Anthony. I didn't really agree to cooperate. They asked me to come voluntarily to testify. I, of course, turned to my employer, who was the State Department at the time, and said, what do you want me to do? I work for you. They said, don't go. So we turned back to the committee and said, we're not coming. And they immediately followed the polite request up with a subpoena. At that point, we thought the White House was going to run cover and say, we're not letting you go until the Supreme Court tells you you have to go. So stand down. And they wouldn't do anything of the kind. They basically said, you're on your own. So I had no choice. My, my attorneys told me I had to honor the subpoena. Otherwise, I would be liable for being in contempt of Congress. I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to spend the money to fight it on my own. So I came and testified uh, because I was compelled. I was probably, Anthony, the only witness 
that didn't have an agenda there. A lot of those witnesses really wanted to take the opportunity to undermine the administration because they were disgruntled. I just wanted to get back to Brussels and go back to work. I wasn't there to, to hurt Trump. I wasn't there to help Trump. I just wanted to tell what I knew under oath, the truth as I could best recall it, and then move on. And the others that testified before and after me clearly didn't have that agenda at all. Why did you think that the conversation wasn't that big of a deal, or let's describe it as a red herring? Because I didn't think it was an impeachable offense. Yeah. And again, just for viewers and listeners, this is the conversation between Trump and Zelensky uh, that the whistleblower yeah. called. Uh, when you parse the words and listen and read the transcript of the call, which again, with 2020 hindsight, I didn't see that until the hearings had already begun because no one produced that readout and no one told any of us, including Ambassador Volcker and Secretary Perry, what had actually gone on on the call. It would have informed a lot of other things that we said and did afterwards had we had we seen what President Trump was trying to express to President Zelensky. But when I read the transcript, there was nothing there that I thought was impeachable. Did I think it was properly phrased? Did I think he should have used that conversation to try and get his, um, you know, the leader of another country to investigate potentially a, a political opponent? No, there are other ways to do that uh, a little more deftly, and all presidents have done it to one degree or another. Obama's done it, Biden has done it, everyone's done it. Uh, I thought it was a little too blatant. And frankly, once it was exposed to the public, Anthony, I thought the pro proper place to handle all of that was the ballot box. You don't like what he said, don't vote for him again. But an impeachment was ridiculous. I mean, listen, you make it, you make a good case. I, again, you know, I dislike President Trump. Him and I have gotten into a row. There was no reason for him to go after my wife on Twitter. Obviously, there's something psychologically damaged about the guy, in my opinion. Uh, and I appreciate your point of view. And I didn't totally understand the first impeachment either. So we can debate whether it was the right thing to do or not. Uh, but I do appreciate your point of view. And that's why I, I wanted to bring you on my podcast. I want to switch a little bit to talk about uh, Rudolph Giuliani, Mayor, Mayor Rudy Giuliani. I had uh, the political reporter Andrew Kurtzman on, who just wrote a biography of, of Rudy this year. And uh, he said in the biography, which I thought was interesting, he said, Rudy created the template for the Trump presidency in terms of some of the bombast and some of the drama and the closest of the two of them. They sort of like worked off of each other and feed it off of each other. Uh, I want to get your opinion on that. Do you think that that's true? Uh, you, you write in the book, obviously, you believe that Mr. Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani hurt the process. So so tell us your thoughts on I think that biographer this. had it backwards. I think, you know, Trump created the template for the Rudy Giuliani post mayoral life, not the other way around. Um, I, I, I think okay. Trump, well, tell I us, think tell Trump us why. used Rudy Giuliani as sort of a fungible tool. Uh, Volker, Perry and I come back from Kiev. We're all excited. We had spent, you know, a day and a half with Zelensky. We said, you know, Trump's got to meet this guy. He'll really like him. And we go into the Oval Office and we sit down all excited and Trump wants to hear none of it. He goes, I don't want to talk about Ukraine. I got other things to deal with. You want to deal with Ukraine? Talk to Rudy. And we're looking at each other. And one of us, it might have been me, it might have been Perry, said, Rudy, what the hell does Rudy have to do with Ukraine? And he said, well, Rudy's been involved. He's spent a lot of time there. He knows what's going on. I trust Rudy. You talk to Rudy. And, <laughs> you know, he said, wait a minute. He's not with the State Department. He's not with the U.S. government. We're trying to get you and a foreign leader together. What the hell does Rudy Giuliani have with, to do with all of that? And Rudy Giuliani was basically, right. you know, at the time, sort of Trump's dustbin. If, you, if he didn't want to deal with something, rather than throw it in the garbage, he would give it to Rudy to deal with. And then once Rudy was off and running, you never know whether Rudy was making the policy or Trump was making the policy. And so a lot of what Rudy said to the members of my team, to, to Volcker and to Perry, we never really knew whether those things were coming from Rudy or whether they were coming from Trump. All right. Well, I mean, and that's another thing about Mr. Trump, the president. He was an outsider. He liked Rudy's outsiderness. He had a distrust for establishment players and people in the State Department. 
uh, it was Ryan's previous, you know, you know, I was in the meetings, R- Rudy put his hand up to be the secretary of state and Trump was very interested in making him the secretary of state, which would have been a colossal disaster. And so I know that there were players that were undermining that for Rudy. You know, they do it rather, I, I, I could never figure this out. You know, all Ryan's previous had to do was go to Rudy and Trump and say, Hey, you'd be a disaster and we can't do that. But he would act like he was Richie Cunningham and then he would stab him in the back in the New York Times. It was like sort of nonsensical stuff. It's probably why we don't hear much about Ryan's previous anymore because of the way he disgraced himself. But but let's go let's go to Trump behind closed doors. You're right about that. He's a complicated person. And we both know he's an attention seeker. Uh what was your relationship with him behind closed doors? Uh as an ambassador. You know, it was it's State it's an interesting official, question, and the only way I can really gauge my relationship with him was to watch him interact with others. And I'm not talking about uh, necessarily people that are low level staff in the White House. He was actually quite, uh, you know, friendly to them and seemed to be a fairly congenial boss. What I'm talking about are people who have four stars on their shoulders who've spent a lifetime in military service. I'm talking about senior members of Senate leadership. I'm talking about other ambassadors like me. And it was interesting. You kind of put people in two categories. They were either supplicants or they tried to treat him as a peer. I was in the latter category. Uh, He was the president of the United States. I was an ambassador. I owed him, first of all, I owed him my job, number one. And number two, I owed him the deference that the office uh, you know, calls for. He is the president after all. But I really didn't need the job. And I told him early on, don't tweet about me. If you don't like what I'm doing, just have someone call me and tell me you don't like what I'm doing and I'll go home. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't need the drama. And he said, no, 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 I would never do that. You know, I'm so grateful that you're willing to serve and take time from your business. And, you know, told me everything I wanted to hear. And we sort of had that relationship. And I, I wasn't bashful about telling him when I thought he was wrong. And again, I would always be deferential in the fact that, hey, this is your call. You're running the show. If you want to do that, go ahead. But here's what's going to happen. And I'm just telling you, if you don't want to hear it, sorry. <laughs> right. So do you think that that worked? Do you think he ultimately got incensed by that? Or do you think he respected it? I think he respected that? it in me and in others who treated him similarly. I think what created my firing was that once the, the hearing was over, um, he put me in the same category as a lot of the other witnesses who I just said previously had an agenda to undermine him. I wasn't trying to do that. But he also knew that if I was going to go around Europe, I got a lot of media in Europe, if I was going to be giving speeches the number one thing that would be on every reporter's mind would have been the impeachment and the thing would never go away. So he wanted me gone in order to make the story go away because the story was attached to me. They tried to get me to resign. I said, I'm not resigning. I didn't do anything wrong. In fact, I had been receiving laudatory emails from Secretary Pompeo and others about what a great job I had been doing. So I said, if you want me gone, you're going to have to fire me. I'm not resigning. And that's what happened. Right. All right. Good for you. Well, you're one of a legion of people, including myself, that were fired by the Trump administration. So perhaps that's a A uh, medal of honor for you to wear. Uh, Yeah, exactly. You, you know, listen, you, you're a very straight shooter guy. I mean, the book is great. You talk very candidly about your life. You talk very candidly about the ups and downs of the Trump administration, the trials and tribulations of being an ambassador. You also, you know, Despite the complexity of Donald Trump, you supported him even after you got fired. By the way, for two years after I got fired, I did support President Trump. It's when I said something that he didn't like on the Bill Maher show and somehow it ricocheted off of my wife, which I will never, ever be able to understand. That's just something off about the man's personality. But you you said that uh, January 6th was the last straw for you. So tell us the way I explain it simply is I put the Trump presidency in two buckets. Bucket one started at the escalator in Trump Tower and went all the way to January 6th. It included Ukraine. It included the pussy tapes. It included Kazir Khan. Any anything you want to mention that people had issue with. To me, I thought all of those were ballot box issues. Okay, you don't like it. Don't vote for the guy the next time. 
Once we got to January 6th, I thought that was a game changer because the one thing that I point out in the envoy is whether it's an autocracy that wants to be a democracy or whether it's a nascent democracy that's trying to become a real democracy, they look to us for the way we turn the keys over in the United States. Nobody turns the keys over from one leader to another like we do. Partly it's ceremony, partly it's legal, but we do it better than anyone. And Trump really fucked that up. And as a result, I can't forgive that. And that to me was an impeachable offense. And, you know, obviously I had already swore off him months prior to that. Uh, but let me push back for a second. Let me be his advocate here. But the election was a fraud. And so he was cheated out of the election and that these election machines were mistabulating the votes. And clearly he's a way more popular guy than sleepy Joe Biden. So he won the election. And this is the reason why he reacted that way. Well, what say do you say things. to that? The first is, was there fraud in the election? Absolutely. Let me just stop and let you know, I don't fucking believe no, no, any no. of that, but I, I just I, had I to test you saying. on this. So go ahead. The question yeah. is, was there fraud in the election? Were there abnormalities? Were there bad machines? Of course there were. But the real question is, did it make a difference in the outcome? And the answer is no. The second thing is, these issues on a state and local level were heard by numerous, numerous judges. And surprisingly, a lot of the judges that heard a lot of these issues dealing with the minutia that you just described were Trump appointees. Now, don't you think everything being equal, if a Trump appointee, all things being equal, could rule in favor of the person who gave them their judgeship? Uh, would probably want to do so if they could legally justify it. Of course they would. Most of them were grateful. But unanimously, he got ruling after ruling after ruling around the country, including from Trump appointees and Bush appointees, that no, there was not, there was a, there was a big nothing burger there when it came to changing the outcome of the election. See, it's a very mature way to look at it because you know, having been around politics a long period of time, there's no system of vote tabulation that's perfect. And so I think we both agree on that. But what you're looking for is the totality test. And he lost the totality of that election. It was very, very clear, I wish and very he convincing. I, and now with 2020 hindsight, looking yeah. at what Biden has done to our country, right. I wished he hadn't lost, but he did. <laughs> right. All right. Well, we, we would probably disagree with that. I, I don't like President Biden's policies, but the January 6th thing is a tell that Mr. Trump is no, not no, in love but, with the democracy. He's remember, not in love with I the system that, that we have in place. Remember, I wish he had not lost so, prior to January 6th. <laughs> no, <laughs> I understand January that, but you, he's a threat. He's a absolutely. threat to the American democracy. So for me, I would, yeah. I'm would. i a Republican ambassador. I would like to see a Ron DeSantis, a Mike Pompeo, a Nikki Haley, somebody different from President Biden but I voted for President Biden because I saw the risk that Mr. Trump was to the American democracy. Prior to January 6th, if you asked me, is Mr. Trump a threat to the American democracy? I would have said yes. And I'm glad he didn't win because I do think he represents that threat. Those other people, Nikki Haley, men and women, Mike Pompeo, Ron DeSantis, I don't think they represent that. And I just think they're better messengers for the Republican Party and for the movement well, of those values think, and what ideas. I think, That's what my I think opinion. we have to do is we have to convince some of the more diehard supporters of President Trump that the policies are what they should be focused on. And three of the candidates of the ostensible candidates, Pompeo, Haley, and Pence, uh, mm -hmm. basically moved those policies forward. So I think, as you say, there are better people to take the Trump policies in 2024 and move them forward. Here's another thing I think we're missing. In 2024, if Trump were fortunate to actually be elected president again, I'm really afraid that he would not be able to govern for four years and that those policies would languish right. and suffer as a result because he would be so tied up yeah, in investigations no, would, and litigation. There's too much, too much hate. So I agree on. with you, What we want is we want to turn the country back around. We need someone who can execute. I don't think Trump can execute at this point. Go I only got a few more questions left for you, Ambassador. You're such a great guest. But at the end of your book, you say China, Russia, and Iran 
present the biggest threats to global peace and prosperity in that order. It's literally, I, I took it right out of your book. Uh, what does the US and the EU need to do to limit well, these threats? What we need to do, first of all, is to identify things vis a vis China that we have no daylight between us. Because the one thing that scares the shit out of China is when they see the US and the EU acting in concert without any daylight on an issue. Because they know together we're unstoppable from an economic standpoint, from a military standpoint, and frankly, from a political standpoint. And they love to exploit daylight. We can't have daylight. Huawei was a classic example of that, where the Trump administration was trying to kill Huawei expansion, but the Europeans loved the price, they loved the deal, and their economics were taking priority over their long-term strategy. We have to focus on that with the EU. And that's why I think the ambassador, whoever the new ambassador is going to be under the next administration, really needs to be plugged into the top four or five people at the White House in order to move that agenda forward. We just talked about Donald Trump. Uh, I think we're both in general agreement that I'll, I'll say it, you agree or disagree. We wouldn't support him to be the nominee in 2024 for the I agree. Republican I Party. agree. Yes, I would not support Fair him. to say? Yes. Oh, okay. 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 So so what are your hopes and predictions then for 2024 well, for the Republican? Well, I think we have an outstanding field of people. Uh, if you go to the ones that have already made their you know, desires known, whether they're formal candidates or clearly signaling that, DeSantis, Youngkin, Haley, Pence, Pompeo, uh, uh, Tim Scott, there's some outstanding people out there and all of whom I think would re return the country back to a more conservative, small government, lower taxes, strong military, border security. You know, you can go down the list. Any one of those candidates would be great. Uh, I haven't yet made a decision personally. I'm getting to know each candidate that I don't happen to know well now. And over the next few months, I plan to get behind someone. But I'm I'm really pleased with our field. I think the Democrats have a real deficit in terms of a field like we do. And I, and I, obviously, I agree with you. But so you are not dissuaded. You were fired by President Trump. You had to withstand the heat of that congressional testimony. Uh, but you're still locked in the the cockpit for Republican Party fundraising with the right candidate. Absolutely. No question about it. And I do this job okay. and I would do I mean, that. And I would I do mean, the job why, I mean, I had in a heartbeat, uh, you know, if I were asked again, because now my, you know, my subject matter knowledge and my learning curve, uh, you know, I could hit the ground running as could many of my colleagues in their respective jobs. Yeah. Well, listen, you, you are terrific. And uh, I, I, I love your straightforwardness. You know, I mean, you 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 grew up in Seattle, but you could be a New Yorker. Okay, you have a much better <laughs> accent than me. But Ambassador, uh, you, I love your straightforwardness. I admire you a great deal. Uh, the title of the book is "The Envoy: Mastering the Art of Diplomacy with Trump and the World." It is a excellent read. It, it's a fresh writing style that you have. It's concise. I learned a lot from the book, uh, and I'm looking forward to helping you promote it. And thank you very much for joining us on. Open book with Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. I really appreciate it.